Hi. Is everyone here for testing and production? Awesome. Cool. I'm Aja. Uh, I am uh, on. I am the Thagomizer on Twitter. I am Thagomizer on GitHub, and I t blog at Thagomizer.com. I did not post the slides yet, but I will post them immediately after the talk. Uh, I am a bad presenter. Um, and I really, really like dinosaurs, so Pittsburgh has been amazing. I landed at like 2 a.m. after like two hours of delay in Chicago because it was snowing, going down the escalator and there's a dinosaur there. It was amazing. I, I love this city. Uh, I work on Google Cloud Platform. I am a developer advocate. Uh, if you're interested in Google Cloud, Kubernetes, other things like that, I'm happy to answer questions and I have plenty of opinions. But you don't have to ask me. We've got seven of us here. We have a booth down in the uh, vendor hall. You can come say hi. I think we might be out of fidget spinners, but I've got a couple that I stored away in my, bath, in my box over here, so afterwards you can get one from me. And we're here because Google loves Ruby. Uh, we love Ruby. It's a group of Rubyists who work on our Ruby support, and I love my Ruby community. So victory conditions for my talk. These are the things that I want you to be feeling or thinking when you leave. First of all, I want folks in this talk to feel comfortable with testing in production. I heard the first testing in production and I had a slightly less polite version of dear heavens no the first time. Uh, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this is actually a good thing. And it isn't scary because in many cases, you're already doing it. You just not, may not be aware of it. And so in addition to being comfortable with the idea of testing in production, I want you to walk away from this talk with the ability to be a bit more intentional about your testing. So I'm gonna do quick, quick definitions. Uh, first definition is production. Production is any environment that is not pre-production. Uh, second definition, uh, testing. For the purposes of this talk, testing is what we as developers call verifying our expectations. Yes, I did just use expectation. Yes, I am a mini tester. It's okay. If it makes you feel better, you can think verifying behavior instead of verifying expectations. So we're Rubyists, we test all the time. One of the things I love about this community is that we test, we test a lot. You wouldn't dream of pushing a gem without at least a couple tests. Not to give documentation, but we, we're good at testing. And we have all of our great test frameworks where we set up a scenario, do some verification, and then hopefully clean up a little bit, call our method under test somewhere in there. These are the traditional tests, so I'm gonna call them, but there's also a huge category of black box testing, which is where I got my career started. I was a black box web tester doing manual testing. But you can do black box tests automated, you do it a fair amount now. Um, all of this is still testing, and I'm bringing this up because we're gonna use both techniques for testing in production. So, why should we test in production? Isn't that naughty? <laughs> the answer is because a real environment gives you real bugs. You find stuff that you just can't find in your pre-fraud environments. For example, production is where you have real user load. While load testing is awesome, and I highly recommend it, most load testing frameworks I've worked with can't actually simulate real user load because humans are fantastic entropy machines. Since I have the time, I'm gonna tell a quick story. Uh, talking to some of my coworkers last week, and I was objecting to a form I had to fill out for another conference I'm doing, and one of my coworkers is like, yeah, whenever I see something I'm not quite okay with, I find a way to hack around it. She's like, I was signing up for a bike share, and for reasons I don't understand, they wanted to know if I was male or female. So I opened up the form and realized that they were storing male as one and female as two. And I managed to convince the server on the other end that I was a four. <laughs> Humans are fantastic entropy machines. Um, other things you can only do in production. Uh, you can test your integrations. Who here uses a billing service of some sort? Audience participation is okay. Okay, your billing provider probably has a test gateway or a test API endpoint that you can hit when you're testing. They probably also provide some test credit cards that you may or may not be able to use against their production endpoint. But at what, how often do you point your staging environment at the real production gateway using and use a real credit card to run a billing transaction through? Whenever I've built something that took credit cards, we did that once or twice before initial rollout, but we didn't do it on a regular basis after that. So if we wanted to test that we were actually integrating with this third party correctly, we had to do it in prod. Uh, if you don't have a billing service, maybe you have a third party storage, use some cloud storage. Um, maybe there are other services like an image processing service or OAuth that you're using. Make sure you're testing those and frequently the only place you can test them for real is prod. Or maybe you don't use third party services but you work on a large team building a huge app. 
and your team builds one microservice and there's other microservices built by other parts of the company. When those come together, that's a seam. How often do you test your seams? How often do you run an integration test across all of this? One of my most frustrating moments at a previous job, we were three days before a big GA, we we're gonna go you know, actually to production with some new stuff, and we had two teams, client, server. We hadn't tested that the two pieces could talk to each other. And out of curiosity, I spun it up, and the first thing it did was crash hard. Because the person who was orchestrating and running the client side team and the person who was orchestrating and running the server side team had had a misunderstanding in the protocol that they had developed between the two. And so it just exploded. So you have to test your seams. I would hope you test them before production, but sometimes sneaky bugs can get in, and testing your seams in production is also valuable. Who's heard the term Heisenbug? So for those of you who don't know it, Heisenbugs are those bugs that can only be produced in production by that one really important client at that one really important company. Uh, maybe it's an artifact of their network or their browser or some sort of security thing they have. But testing in prod allows you to find these. Uh, same company as the last story. We had a very important client who's like, so it mostly works, but like we do this one thing, something weird happens. It doesn't crash, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem right. Spent about a month and a half debugging with them remotely, and finally we picked up laptops and went and took a site visit. It was about an hour away. We get there, and they're like, well, what are you planning on doing? We're like, well, we're going to run a you know, network speed test, because it appears that you aren't getting the full download. And they're like, oh, that's not going to work, because we cut off any download greater than a specific number of kilobytes. <laughs> and we're like, uh-oh. <laughs> but we wouldn't have found that unless we had been testing in prod. So, the second thing about testing in prod is I heard this at a meetup about nine months ago, my favorite meetup in Seattle, other than Seattle IB, Coffee Ops. Someone's like, hey, I wanna talk about testing in prod today. I'm like, awesome. What's testing in prod? And this person goes on and on, I'm like, I'm thinking I'm gonna learn new stuff here. They're talking about monitoring, they're talking about logging, they're talking about tracing, they're talking about blue-green deployments and canaries, and I'm like, oh, there's nothing new here. This is stuff that's been often in common use since the 60s in many cases. Everything I talked about today is techniques that I have seen in use since I got started in tech in 2002. So I guess that means I'm old now. So preemptively, I'm telling you all to get off my lawn. <laughs> so I've talked a little bit about the background, but I haven't talked about the how. So to keep myself on track, because I'm gonna talk about a lot of techniques, I'm gonna throw a lot of words at you, I'm not gonna give you a ton of specifics, but I'm gonna give you enough that you know which ones are interesting and know what to search for if you wanna find out more. I've divided this talk into four sections. Uh, deployment testing, user-focused testing, reusing tests, and my favorite one, implicit testing. Let's dive in. Deployment testing. So the first technique I'm gonna talk about is canaries. Canary is just a phased rollout where you roll out your release gradually to some of your servers at a time over a course of minutes, hours, days, or even weeks. You have a subset of your users or a subset of your servers that's gonna receive the new code. Once you've rolled it out, you monitor vigorously for things like error, memory, disk, but you also might want to monitor for user-based metrics like free, tr free trial conversions or purchase path completion. If everything is thumbs up, you expand the canary group. And you keep doing this, release a bit more, monitor, expand, until you've rolled out your uh, new release to all of your servers. So that's all great, but how do you choose your canary group? So you can use internal users. Sometimes we call this dog fooding. Um, you can push out to people who don't have a choice but to use your new version and find all the bugs in it. You can just choose randomly. I'm gonna choose, you know, I've got 600 servers, 600 uh, containers, I'm just gonna choose some of them. You can do it geographically. This is how a lot of folks do it. They're like, okay, we're gonna start with a small percentage of the servers in US West. And we're gonna switch, then we're gonna do that entire data center, then we're gonna go to US East, then we're gonna go to Europe, then we're gonna go to Asia. You can do it based on your demographic. Maybe you only wanna roll this out to users who are new or users who log in 18 times a day and you're not quite sure why they're using your product so much, but yay. <laughs> uh, you can also ask users to sign up to find out to get access to stuff early. We're gonna get into that in a little bit, but you can also use it for canaries. And the cool thing is you can pick as many of these as you like. You can use any sort of slice and dice combination so that you, the goal is you start with a small group and you roll it out gradually to make sure that whatever you're doing is not toxic, does not take down your environment. Second deployment strategy is blue-green deployments. All you have is two copies of prod. <laughs> two copies, one is blue, one is green. Uh, in this case, the blue is live and the green is idle. One is always live, one is always idle. 
When you want to roll out new code, you deploy it to the idle side, in this case the green. Once it's up and running, you have your new code on your idle, your old code on uh, your live, you start routing traffic to the new code. So now we end up switching live and idle, and you've done your deployment. Nice thing about this is if something goes wrong, it's an easy rollback, because you had the previous known good version live just a couple minutes ago, so you can just swap whatever router rule you did to move your traffic and move it back. It's also, depending on how you do your, your blue-green, might be really good for disaster recovery. If your blue and green are in different parts of the same data center, and you have a partial data center power outage, which I have been through multiple times, you might be able to move traffic back to your other half of prod, because you've got two copies of everything. It's fantastic. Having two copies of everything, though, is not always great. Uh, doing databases basis with blue-green deployment is kind of a pain. So don't use databases. Uh, or maybe just leave your databases out of your blue-green clusters. If you want your databases to be part of the system, you can do things with snapshotting and replication, but depending on exactly your database setup and how good you are at uh, setting up your databases and how often you're writing, you may have a little bit of a blimp as you blip, as you flip, which one of your databases is the replica and which one is uh, running is the main one. Or you can use a non-relational database. A lot of the problems with relational data databases and replication and stuff are solved if you use a non-relational database. Non-relational databases are awesome. Um, when I started my career, uh, we used a variation of this technique when we did rollouts. Uh, we divided our server cluster in half, A half and B half. We did, and we would deploy to A. We would test it behind a firewall. Once it was good, we would route all the traffic to A, and then we'd deploy to B. This was not true blue-green, though, because we couldn't actually run the site successfully at peak load on just half of the cluster. We had to have at least two-thirds of it up. So we could only use this technique late at night, and we didn't have the hot swappable backup at all times. But testing and prod, do what works for you. Both of these techniques, plus many of the others I'm gonna talk about, work well in conjunction with auto rollback. In auto rollback, you have some predetermined metrics, and if you ever hit you know, those thresholds, condition is tripped, and your, your deployment system automatically rolls back to a known good release. To do this, you have to make sure stuff is scripted, but I'm hoping most of you have scripted your deploys at this point. Like when I started, I was releasing based on a 34-point printed out checklist, so I hope you guys are doing better than I was. And if you're gonna do auto rollback, you need to be very conscious and careful about your data or database migrations. If you go back, will you lose important data? Will the old code actually work against the new schema? Things you need to consider. Is anyone still using session affinity or sticky sessions? Okay, I figured there were still a couple of us out here. If you're using WebSockets, it's really hard to get around, actually. Uh, sticky sessions and session affinity, if your user has to hit a specific server, because that's where their connection's established, how are you going to deal with that when that server goes away? Things to think about. The biggest thing you can do is you can separate your data migrations from your code pushes. Push the code, make sure the code can work with both versions of the schema, then do the data migration. Once everything's stable, then push code that can only work with the new version. It's a really common pattern, lots of us have been doing it for years. Again, get off my lawn. But it's an important thing to know because it's not the way you're taught when you're doing Rails as a newbie. Second section, user-focused tests. Uh, these are things that test the user experience and you're like, I'm a developer, that's not testing and prod. Totally counts. You're just testing something than the underlying stability and correctness of your code. Yeah. Who's done A-B testing? Yay, people test stuff in prod, it's fantastic. A-B testing is just an experiment. You have a control group and you have some number of experimental groups. You run the users through different experiences when you have enough data to be statistically valid, law of big numbers and all. You figure out if there are significant behavioral differences between the groups and you decide which one you're gonna go with. Different than uh, blue-green because both are live at the same time. Blue-green, remember, one is always live and one is always idle, but in an A-B test, uh, they're both live at the same time, which means you have some interesting things with data integrity. Another way of doing user-focused testing is betas and EAPs. For those who haven't heard the term, because uh, I hadn't before I started working at Google, uh, EAP is an early access program. It's like a beta, but usually before a beta, but not an alpha. <sighs> and these give you an ability to test your stability and more specifically the usability of something you're about to push because nothing finds edge cases the way users find edge cases. <laughs> but it's important if you're gonna one run of these programs that you give users enough time. I know folks are like, we had a beta for like eight whole hours. 
No, not a beta. Give, you need to give people multiple weeks in many cases so that they can use your product over time, make sure that it works for all of the scenarios they do, not just kind of glance at it and say, hey, I like the new colors. And you need to make sure that your expectations are clear. If there's an expectation that someone who participates in your EAP is gonna give a specific amount of feedback, you need to make sure that's clear up front. You also need to tell them where the known issues are. Every beta's got some edges, some places where we know stuff's broke. Tell them about that ahead of time, because you don't wanna actually have 19 bug reports that are the same. Third section, uh, reusing tests. So there was a fantastic talk on Monday about uh, checkups, and this is similar to that content. Um, but I have stories that are different, because I've done it as well. Um, the really thing I like about this is that each and every one of you can do that. Running a usability test or a beta is gonna require cooperation of many other people. Changing your deployment process, unless you hold the keys to deployment, is gonna require the cooperation of many other people. You can do everything in this section without talking to anyone. It's awesome. So the big thing is to like run smoke tests against production. Uh, another story, I was working at a relatively large internet company that was not my current employer, and I had been doing manual testing, but I got permission to start doing some basic automated testing with a really, really clunky record playback tool. Record playback tools make really, really brittle tests, but you know, better than nothing. I'd rather not run that same test manually 15 times a day. And I was sitting there one day and I'm like, hey, I've got these extra servers in my office because I was running the test lab because I used to get cold, servers make warm. And I'm like, hey, I could, I could run these smoke tests against production, right? You know, I would hope that they never fail. So I set it up, set them to run every four hours on a, you know, on a cron, set it up so it would email me if it failed and then, you know, let it go. And it worked for a couple days and I was really excited and then I promptly mostly forgot that this was happening. Come back from lunch one day about two months later and I have an email saying it failed. And I'm like, there's no way it failed. Like, if this was actually down for 30 minutes, someone would have noticed. So I go run the test manually and actually it had failed. Uh, one of our suppliers was uh, not sending all the information we needed um, to, our, to us when we made a request. And normally monitoring would catch this, but I, something along the lines of they were sending back a response, it was just the response body was empty. So we were getting 200s, not failures. Uh, meant that it didn't get caught by normal monitoring, but it did get caught by this test. So I'm like, hey, um, is, is broken. And we managed to t contact the third party that we were using, bring, have them fix their thing, make sure our stuff was still working. We managed to do it all within a couple hours before anyone noticed. Because we wouldn't have caught this bug without a user notice unless I'd been running these smoke tests that I normally use for releases and day-to-day -day testing against production. And no one knew that I had set that up. I just, you know, had a server, might as well. I've been using the term smoke test. Uh, for folks who don't know, a smoke test is a super simple test of the core functionality of your product. Comes from the idea of where there's smoke, there's fire, or if this fails, something is on fire. And I personally believe that even really big, complicated uh, products will have relatively few smoke tests. Everywhere I've worked, we've kept it under six. I would imagine almost everyone can keep it under a dozen, because you're just testing the very basics. Um, so if you're gonna do this, pick a subset of your existing tests. You probably have something that you would consider smoke test in your integration suite already. Just reuse it. Set it on a schedule. Every n hours, once a day, once a week, whatever makes sense. Focus on things like your third party integrations and absolute core functionality of your product. Um, and I'm gonna point out here that if you use something like the VCR gem when you normally run your tests so that the tests run faster and you don't make requests against a third party, consider not doing that when you're doing these tests against production because you're not actually testing your integrations if you're faking out the integration part of it. And the big thing is leave no trace. Your tests should absolutely leave no trace. Ideally, you want them to clean up after themselves. Because of this, most of my smoke tests don't do purchases. Everywhere I've worked that I've been involved in doing the database schema, our purchase database has not allowed updates or deletes. It's only subsequent writes. So if I did a purchase, I couldn't delete it. If you have a system like that, make sure that you have a way of uh, not doing purchases, or if you do purchases, you can flag those, because you don't want, I've been running this test every minute, and all of a sudden, we are making tons of money <laughs> to show up in your reports. On to my last section, and I'm gonna call this next section controlled breakage. So basically, controlled breakage, uh, you want to purposefully and deliberately break various parts of your system. Take servers down, pretend that the disk went bad, pretend that your network pipe got really, really small. And what are you testing in this case? You're testing your ability to respond and recover. Is your system supposed to be self-healing? Does it? Or is your, the person carrying the pager supposed to detect these types of errors and address them? Do they? 
And I really like this testing. I did start my career in test. I fundamentally love breaking things. It is fantastic and wonderful and it is one of my favoriteest things. So the first time I got permission to do this, I went nuts. I found all sorts of stuff that was completely and utterly busted, writing up all these bugs, and then they all start coming back as won't fix, won't fix, won't fix. Because just like security, durability is something where you can never be absolutely durable. You can be more durable or less durable, but it's always a trade-off between durability and the amount of engineering time you want to dedicate to it, which is a proxy for cost. And it doesn't make sense to be durable against, you know, four lightning strikes in a row that hit your server directly because it's not a realistic scenario for most people most of the time. So if you're gonna do this, stay in scope. Stay in the scope of stuff that makes sense. Stay in the scope of stuff that you, you and your team have agreed should be, you should be able to respond to. I can't talk about controlled breakage without mentioning Netflix's Simeon Army and Chaos Monkey. They're open source, go check them out, they're cool. And we actually do this kind of testing, this controlled breakage testing at Google. Uh, we call it DIRT, uh, disaster recovery testing. Um, I, have, I have not participated as an engineer in that process, but I found a fantastic talk that if everything worked correctly should be tweeted under my Twitter handle already, and you should go watch it. It's by one of the SREs who started the DIRT process and has some fantastic stories about things that they accidentally and on purpose did to test the disaster recovery and durability of Google. Related is penetration testing. Who's been able to do some pen testing? I got to do some, it's a, I got to do some about six months ago and it was awesome. I got a week of time and I were just, I'm just hacking against stuff. It was fantastic. Uh, it's really, really fun to put yourself in the mind of an, uh, you know, evil adversary. You got like your curly mustache, you know, horrible hat thing going on, doing some Rocky and Bullwinkle stuff there. And it's totally another form of controlled breakage. You try to figure out kinds of mistakes that you likely have made and figure out if you've patched against them. But since we're talking about this, I'm going to talk about the fact that controlled breakage needs to be ethical breakage. Uh, DHH touched on this in his keynote, that we have the power for both good and evil. Make sure you're using your power for good. Think carefully about the potential impacts of your choices on your users, on your company, on your jobs. Want to make sure that the choices you are making are reasonable and ethical. And every time I've worked on penetration testing or talked to folks about it, there's always rules of play. Uh, frequently for big exercises, there's also a proctor who can make sure that you are playing fair and you are being ethical in what you're doing. Uh, my last form of uh, testing in production is disaster recovery and verification. Who has a DR plan? Who's tested it in the last year? <laughs> so congratulations, you guys have successfully tested in production and you're doing better than the vast majority of the audience. So the disaster recovery is when you make a plan for your data center catching on fire in a way that you can't predict. I did a talk at RubyConf in Cincinnati about the time that they were replacing pieces in the uh, power conditioners. The power conditioners at the data center caught on fire. We were down for an hour and then we ran on diesel for 11 days. It was an error that the supplier of the power system had never ever seen before. It was not supposed to be able to happen. So therefore disaster. Disaster recovery is how you're planning on dealing with things like that. And this is for real needs to happen in production. If you haven't tested this plan in production, you haven't tested it, because by its very nature, your disaster recovery plan is for when something bad happens in production. You need to move traffic to another cluster. Maybe you need to move data between data centers. Maybe you need to restore databases from a backup. Uh, I accidentally deleted, well, I accidentally corrupted a production database at 11 p.m. at night once, because I ran uh, the feature branch migrations instead of trunk migrations against it. Yeah, that was fun. Uh, luckily, I had taken a database backup right before I did that, so I was able to restore from the backup. And I knew how to restore from the backup because I had actually been practicing that on a regular basis. So I was able to do it without thinking because I was freaked out. I was like, oh God, they're gonna fire me, they're gonna fire me, they're gonna fire me. But it all ended up being okay. As part of DR, you wanna make sure you're testing scripts, all the scripts that do network migrations, database restores, all that but you're also testing your people. And everyone's like, testing people isn't testing? Ha, there's my mini test test for testing people right there. Um, so implicit testing. Um, this last section I'm calling implicit testing, I originally was gonna call it passive testing, but I didn't like the way that sounded. This is the testing that you're all already doing, but you don't actually think of as testing. So that's a stack driver monitoring graph of memory usage on an internal app that I, I work on at Google. Um, that's a spike, and if this was actually a mission-critical app, I would have hoped to be alerted to that spike. Luckily, if it goes down for a couple of days, we don't actually care that much. 
But I'm talking about monitoring. What does monitoring have to do with testing? So who's got monitoring? Raise your hand, please, most of you, thank you. Um, who has alerts on their monitoring? Turns out alerts are tests. Think about that for a minute. We think of alerts as the thing that tells us that something is wrong. But if we, you know, massage the English a little bit, they tell us that the system isn't meeting expectations. And back at the beginning of this talk, I defined testing as verifying that your expectations are met. So by definition, alerts are testing. Still don't believe me? Say I have an alert if latency is greater than 500 milliseconds. Ha, there's my test. And to, if you're gonna be doing your monitoring, too many folks I know just look at the system for a couple of weeks, like, yeah, this is what it's supposed to look like, and set up their alerts based on that. I encourage you to take a step back and think about how you want your system to be working. Think about the kinds of behavior that you need. Maybe you have an endpoint that's hit 90% of your traffic goes through that endpoint. That one should probably respond pretty fast, huh? Maybe you want your error rate to be less than 5%. Set that test up. Or maybe you think that your disk should never be more than 80% full. Set that test up. We just call these tests alerts. And the variation on this is looking at month over month or year over year trends so that you can actually answer questions and make assertions like our error rate should not get larger and our site should not get slower. Uh, here's a screenshot from Stackdriver Trace of the same app uh, doing a, I believe this is a month over month, this is actually a year over year comparison, I believe. Uh, yeah, it is. And you can see that it's bimodal and depending on which one the blue is, new or old, it maybe got a little bit slower on the, on the far end where responses are slower, but it mostly looks the same. So I feel pretty okay that my assertion that behavior has not actually changed, and my expectation that behavior hasn't changed is actually a valid expectation. Again, because I was having fun with this, you want to assert that your error rate, your old one and your new one are the same, or hopefully that your new error rate is less. So I've thrown a whole bunch of thoughts at you, ideas, words. I'm gonna give you some basic do's and don'ts. So, and at the end there's a cheat sheet so you don't have to take pictures of every slide and I will publish the slides. So, do you have clear goals? You should go into this intentionally. Figure out what your goals are. Figure out what your expectations are and start from there when you're picking what you wanna monitor and test in production. Don't DDoS yourself. Um, so, I was doing a disaster recovery test. We took down a server that was holding a bunch of web sockets. We're like, okay, the clients are supposed to reconnect. So they reconnect to you know, the fallback server, and the fallback server promptly falls over because it wasn't, it wasn't capable of handling that many simultaneous reconnections. And so it falls over, and so the clients start trying to reconnect as we bring it back up, and it falls over again. We got into a cycle of fail. Um, so we learned things, but in the process of our, our disaster recovery testing, we accidentally DDoSed ourselves with our own app. So don't do that, it's bad. Think carefully about the possible impacts of the tests you're about to do before you do them. We talked about it before, but test your seams, test where your stuff integrates with the people who sit, you know, down the hall, or the people who sit on the other slack if you work remote. Um, don't mess with user data. No, 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 no. We do not mess with user data. We do not view user data unless we have a really good reason. If your company does not have a user data access policy, you should do that thing. It's the right thing to do. Keep your tests as walled off as possible and make sure that they, they aren't considered user data as well because you don't want that data corrupting any of your other reports. And do clean up after yourself. Do the Girl Scout thing, leave no trace, be a, be a good citizen. This is one of my soapboxes. Alerts should be actionable. So if you're using alerts as a form of test, awesome, but make sure that a test that isn't urgent does not page someone at 3 a.m. They get this a page and there is nothing that they can actually do other than go back to bed and deal with it in the morning. They shouldn't have been paged in the first place. It's the way we get uh, ops burnout. Just don't do it. Uh, verify your integrations. After that experience in my first job where I found the bug that we hadn't found just by running some of the smoke tests against production, I now trust but verify all of my third party integrations on a regular basis because um, they can fail. And more actually common than the third party failing is they updated their uh, API and you didn't actually get the email and you were using VCR so you were getting the old responses and then kaboom. So make sure you're testing. And the big one is whatever you choose to do, act methodically. Make sure you are doing stuff with a purpose and a plan so that if something goes completely wrong, you know what you've done and you know how to undo it. Here's your cheat sheet, have clear goals. Test your seams, verify your integrations, clean up after yourself, don't DDoS yourself. Leave user data alone and keep alerts actionable. Um, I wanna say thank you and get off my lawn.
the question is how do you handle auth against production servers? So the way I've always done it is I've created the magical test account. Um, and the nice thing about that is that everything that's associated with the magical test account, I know to ignore. Um, I worked at a place where we used a specific last name for magical test accounts. It started with five X's. Uh, so we hopefully wouldn't pick up anyone's real name in the SQL queries. Uh, and that's because we wanted to, part of our smoke was testing sign up, so we had to create new accounts. Um, there are other ways to do it. There are tools you can do. There are companies that actually offer production testing services. Do the right thing for you, just you're already testing in production, so you might as well do it on purpose. Okay, thank you all. <laughs>